Welcome to the Becoming Superhuman Podcast, where we interview extraordinary people to bring you the skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Levy. Before we get started, I want to ask you a question. Every single week, we bring you these episodes full of dozens of skills, habits, routines, and strategies to help you become more superhuman. Now, be honest. What percentage of those things are you actually able to implement in your life? Of course not. You need the accountability and community. And that's why in 2018, I launched the Becoming Superhuman Mastermind. Every month as a community, we invite a world-renowned expert in to lead a one-month challenge. Past challenges have included environmental design with Benjamin Hardy, hacking your sleep with Nick Littlehales, who is Cristiano Ronaldo's own sleep coach, and meditation with Muse founder Ariel Garten. On top of that, we send out a care package with all the gear and goodies you need to complete that month's challenge. And best of all, as a member, you get exclusive discounts to all kinds of events, courses, supplements, and gear. And those discounts alone are worth more than your entire membership. Look, as a listener, of this podcast, we know that you stand to benefit a great deal from being in the group, but also that you stand to contribute a lot. And that's why we're offering 50% off your first month. To join, visit superhuman.blog slash mastermind today. Greetings, super friends, and welcome to this week's episode. You guys, this week we are joined by Shlomo Freund. He is an entrepreneur who over the last 15 years has slowly built the life that he really wanted for himself by conducting careful finances and creating a location-independent lifestyle with a good work and life balance and passive income streams. You see, Shlomo started by building a successful company in China and over time realized that what he wanted was a remote lifestyle. And today, he actually helps people avoid the regular approach of making and saving money for its own sake and waiting until the end of life to be able to travel and see the world and relax. And he and his wife, as I spoke to him, are in Sri Lanka with their three-year-old traveling and working and just enjoying life. And I know a lot of you are really, really interested in remote lifestyles and think that you need to have all kinds of skills or all kinds of money to be able to travel and live and work in this kind of free way. And the truth is, that is BS. You can actually do this. You can actually become location independent. You can actually achieve this incredible life of adventure. And in this episode, you are going to learn how. So I really enjoyed the episode. It definitely inspired me to have some conversations with my fiance. And I think you're really going to enjoy it as well. Let me introduce my super friend, Shlomo Freund. Shlomo. Good to see you and meet you again. Welcome. How are you? Hello, hello. Great to hear you again. We've met a few times and I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a really, really long time and I'm really looking forward to catching up. You've had a lot of very interesting and exciting changes in your life, so I can't wait to hear all about them. Sure. <laughs> so tell the audience, for those who haven't met you at uh, Cacao and had coffee with you, Tell the audience a little bit about yourself, what you do, and how you got to where you are. Oh, that's a long one. So what I do now is I help people eliminate money as a source of stress and gain confidence in their future finances. Basically, I help people build a plan that align their life and lifestyle goals with their finances and then execute it. That was easy. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, wait, wait. (laughs) The thing is that um, we spoke a little bit about the personal part. So we are a location-dependent family. I have a three-year-old daughter, and we homeschool her. So we definitely love this uh, flexible lifestyle where we go on long vacations for, like, let's say, two, three months every time. I'm now speaking with you from Sri Lanka, so that's awesome. And that's basically it. Very cool. And... I know people in the audience are thinking like, okay, well, this guy must, you know, have done something big or must not have to worry about money anymore. And that's why 
you know, he can do this. So tell me a little bit about your past entrepreneurially and otherwise, and how you got to this point where you're like, you know what, I think I want to change what I'm doing. And I think I want to become location independent. Because I think a lot of people, especially, you know, Israelis think like, oh, well, I couldn't do this. And my fiance is guilty of this as well. She's like, well, I couldn't do this because Israelis don't do this. Or, you know, they don't want to become Israeli uh, location independent, you mean? You, well, it, there's always someone in the audience who goes, well, I couldn't do it because insert X, because I'm a doctor and my work requires me to be, you know, in the office or I'm Israeli and English isn't my first language. And so I can't, you know, so tell me a little bit about your past and your history. Sure. So I think my most important work history starts in China. That was in 2007. And um, I went to learn Chinese for two months there. Fast forward a few years, I moved to China with my wife. We decided, like, why not go live in China and see how it is? And that was not yet when we're location independent, but we wanted to try it and have the experience. And this is where I built one of my companies uh, right there, which is active till now, which is called App in China. Well, that's not yet location independent, but that was already the companies dealing with mobile apps. So basically, that can be done remotely. But I didn't this, do this remotely till then. Only after we left China, that was three years after, my wife started working for a Chinese company remotely, and I managed the company remotely. And since then, we're basically fully remote. Incredible. Now, talk to me about why remote living was important for you. I mean, you have a three-year-old. It would have been very easy when your child was born to go, okay, you know, time to settle down and do what everyone else does. I mean, it's, it's not easy to travel. It's probably not easy to raise a child in Sri Lanka. You don't exactly know what the best brand of diapers is in every country you go to. Oh, they're expensive. <laughs> oh, I bet they are. So tell me about that decision. I mean, that's like a pretty non-traditional decision to say, let's pick up with our toddler and go live remotely. I mean, how did you guys come to that decision? So I think that for us, because exploring and, you know, understanding other cultures and living in other places was so important for us. So even before she was born, that was a thing for us. So we just had to incorporate this into how we live. I think that a lot of things that people have in their mind is still about money issues when and flexibility, like how it's going to work. And by now, I feel that we took stress out of money. And I'm saying this not because we're super wealthy. That's not the thing. It's about being confident in our lifestyle and our finances. Now, for our girl, it's actually, I can't say easy because everyday life sometimes is not easy. But in terms of travel with her, seeing new things, we send her sometimes like to a local kindergarten. This time we send her to a local kindergarten here. So she get all these new experiences and we're happy about this. So actually, it's not so much about the hardship of that, except when she doesn't want to do certain things. It's about just making the decision and go with the flow. Really, really cool. Now, that's a nice segue into talking about money. And I'm going to be open and vulnerable here and say that the reason that I wanted to have you on the show so much is I have money anxiety. And I, I recently worked with a coach to figure out uh -huh. that for me, the money anxiety is it's not status, it's not ego. For me, money literally means freedom. And I think that's why you and I see eye to eye so much. For me, money is the ability to drop everything and go to a friend's wedding in India. It's the ability to say, you know what, I don't want to have to work this month and just take the whole month off and spend time with my family. And so I feel a little bit better about that. But at the end of the day, I still have money anxiety, which is stupid. Because, you know, with all the humility in the world and all ego aside, I have more money than I need. And so walk me through that. I mean, walk me through money mindset, walk me through, you really hit on a nerve when you're like, let's talk on this show about money anxiety and people <laughs> around money. I was like, Oh, yeah, yeah, this is going to be a good episode. So talk to me about that. I mean, where do we even dive in? So I think that the main thing is really creating the confidence, maybe God knows, I mean, you're not my client, we never spoke about this of why you got that money anxiety. But 
it's more about having a plan, a clear plan of what's going to be with those finances and that in your lifestyle and how will they align eventually. And once you know that, you know, I'm very content in where I am because, and this is why I'm able to live that lifestyle that I want, because I know where I am. I'm very confident about this. And even though I'm not financially free, I know I'll get there. I have a plan. I know where things are going. So I'm very content. So I think that's where a lot of people are are lacking. Now, the problem with this is that people are procrastinating about it, right? Nobody wants to talk about money and do anything about this. Then if you're not dealing with this, this become a larger and larger problem over time. And sometimes it's already too late to really take care of those problems. So the earlier you do it, the, the earlier you deal with it, with the better. Now, when you say make a plan, are you talking about have systems set up that earn you money? I mean, because one of the ways that I'm dealing with this income anxiety, and I think a little bit of income anxiety comes naturally to us as entrepreneurs, because you know we have over a dozen people that put food on the table every day because of you know the efforts that I put in in this company. And so I know that it's not just me that are relying on the money that my business makes, but also many people, all of whom have families and mm-hmm. so on. But the way that I'm dealing with my own personal income anxiety is to engineer systems and set up goals so that I have investments, I have income sources, whether or not my business is earning, because there are always ups and downs in business, that take care of my needs and beyond. Is that what you mean when you talk about planning, or or what does that planning actually look like? Not completely. Yes, you've touched the income streams, but when I'm talking about a plan, I'm actually talking about a a roadmap. It's something that I work with other people. And... um, it has four elements. The first one is going to get your financial knowledge in order. And it's not rocket science. It's a few simple tools to really get going. And the second one is really thinking about your desired lifestyle. So you have the lifestyle that you chose for yourself, living in Tel Aviv, building this brand. God knows how far ahead you planned. I have this flexible lifestyle that I enjoy, and this is what I plan to do hopefully for the rest of my life. It might change, but this is what I like now. Okay, so I'm planning for this. So I have my lifestyle designed. Then after we have the basics of the knowledge and what exactly we want to achieve, then we need to get into the numbers and really understand where we are. And only at the last part is what you said, plan and execute. This means to know how much you need to save and invest, how much things make, and then make that happen. So it's not only about making those income streams, it's matching them with the desired lifestyle and the whole package I said. So I really like that. It's kind of like first you need to set a number and then I imagine what happens for a lot of people is they go, oh, that's all I need to live the life of my dreams forever. It's like, you know, I thought I needed millions, but actually I only need to make this much money per month and I'm kind of set. And then it's, okay, now that we know that this is an achievable, attainable, realistic goal, let's engineer systems that actually bring that amount in. Exactly. And you can plan years ahead. I mean, I can give you tons of examples. Let's say that you just got married and then a few years later you have a child and then you know that you want to help them with their college in 20 years, 18 years. You can plan for that now. And it's important to plan for that now because... If you do that, that will save you a lot of money. Now, multiply that, but all those large expenses that you want in your life, and you're saving a lot if you're just going to think about that now and not procrastinate. You can save for that. You can invest that money just to reach that goal, specifically in that example for your kid's college. And choose your investments based on the ideal timeline, based on the risk, based on all those different Exactly. Things. And the, the desired ROI, the yearly ROI, you can plan all that. Just you need to do it. <laughs> People don't do it because it's never urgent. It's one of those things that are important and not urgent. So nobody deals with them. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. The Eisenhower quadrant. You are the productivity master. So <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you this. Oh, but it's so true. And I mean, if I told you, I have to admit I'm guilty of this, right? Because if I told you the number that I threw out, which is in my three-year goals, 
and it's in my one-year goals. Like I, I've broken it down that I need to get to this amount by three years, this amount by the end of the year of passive income outside of my business for exactly this reason. But if I told you the number, you'd laugh. You'd be like, why do you need to bring in that much money outside of your active income? Like that's silly. It's just a, a big number that I threw out. Uh-huh. And it, it's realistic if I reallocate and move things around and, and invest in a bunch of different things and leverage, it's definitely attainable, but it's pretty silly. <laughs> So you need to think if what you really chose is something that you really need. If you really want it, maybe that's eligible. Just come to that out of a choice and not out of, you know, go with the flow. Mm -hmm. If that works for you, fine. So maybe you realize that, okay, maybe I don't need that much and maybe I can stop working now and don't take only a month vacation. Take a five-year vacation just because now you understand that you can. Right. I do think there's an element for us entrepreneurs as well, though, where it's like work gives us so much excitement and passion. I was in um, a strategic coach seminar and I thought I was pretty bad, right? Because even my quote unquote vacations are work related. And, you know, I'll always fill in some meetings and, and I'll choose my vacations based on where there's conferences or seminars or Genius Network or whatever it may be. But I'm sitting in the room and, and they're talking about the concept of free days. You know, you have free days, focus days and buffer days and free days are 100% free. You don't check your email. You don't take a couple calls in the evening. Nothing. I think you have Tuesdays for that, right? I do. Yeah. Tuesdays, Fridays and Saturdays. I haven't been respecting Tuesdays as much as I should. But there were people, a lot of people in this room who were like, what do you mean? Like, why wouldn't I work? I've been working seven days a week for the last 15 years. Why would I ever take that Friday, Saturday off? Like, at least I do a couple phone calls before my kid's soccer game on Friday. And they're like, no, no, you, you need to actually take free days and you should work towards taking three free days a week, you know, and you should probably try, the ideal goal is to get to 30 to 35 free days a quarter. And people were just uh -huh. having like anxiety attacks in the room. So it's not about, you know, as fellow entrepreneur, it's, I understand that, of course. I mean, people don't want to stop working, but it's not about the time that you work. It's about choosing if you want to work. Okay. That's to, just to get to that point of choice. You can decide not, or you can decide that you do. It's just that from a certain point onwards, it just, as simple as that decision. Do I want to work today or don't want to work today? And nothing will happen if I'm not going to work today or whatever period of time. Yes. So it's the choosing part. The point of uh, strategic coach is that the more time you take away to recharge, the more uh, you allow yourself to go, hey, I don't want to work today. You know, my kid has the soccer game and I want to be 100% present and just focus and go and enjoy that. Or, you know, I want to go spend the whole day learning or going to a museum. The more you do that, the more effective you actually will be when you work. So it's having the peace of mind, as you say, you know, the comfortability and the confidence to go, I don't have to work today. I'm not feeling like I should work today. And that's only going to benefit me. That's powerful. Yeah. I, well, it, it's easier said than done. I've been working on it, you know, <laughs> I've been in this program for two weeks and uh, it's, you know, a program that you're supposed to be in for years and years and years and years. It's easier said than done because you realize very quickly that your free days aren't really free. Like I'll take Tuesdays off, but you know, if someone asks, Hey, I can only meet on Tuesday, I'll take the call, you know, and I'll check my email in the morning before I go off to my free day. And that's not a free day. So, so it's disqualified. It's disqualified. Yeah. So I want to ask what types of investments when you work with clients, what types of investments are you preferring? What types of things are people investing in? I'm very curious about this because it is, I think you and I are aligned around this idea of finding investments that help kind of automate your comfort and are stable enough that you can have that confidence financially. So... I do various things. I diversify. So part of my investments are in stock portfolios that would be in Israel and mainly in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Then I also uh, invest in real estate, uh, international, not in Israel. That's what I prefer. I think it's much, much better these days. So I, I don't see you. a reason why. <laughs> we can talk about this later. And I also do uh, P2P and crowd investing. So I'll do all of those, uh, especially in Eastern Europe. I 
do with a couple of platforms. So uh, that's my blend that works for me. And, you know, you move them around from time to time, but that's basically it. Mm -hmm. And I, I would imagine based on the conversation we've had so far that you're more focused on stable monthly income than growth. That's a good question. Depends on what, you know, because when I'm thinking about my uh, real estate, that will be stable income. But when I'm thinking about my stock portfolios, these are value investments. So that would be over time growing. So there could be bad years, but since it's all long term, I don't really mind. They will grow over time. So that's the growth part. So I do both. Yeah. I do have to admit, after going through an MBA and I mean, I've invested in the stock portfolio since before I was a conscious being because my grandparents, that's how they they decided to invest in my college. I kind of don't believe in the stock market anymore. Okay. I understand the principles and I just now view it as a legalized form of betting. And the real moment for me was spending time in the MBA classroom and learning that actually a company's performance is only one of about 20 different metrics that can move the stock. And once you realize that, it's like you realize that it's primarily speculation and moving around assets that aren't real. You know, they're imaginary, unlike real estate, mm -hmm. unlike many, many other things that are real assets that you can see and touch. So I, I'm still invested to some extent in the stock market for diversification, but I've really become less and less a believer. <laughs> That's interesting. But that would mean that, so let's say in modern times now, it will be the stock's performance would be different than previously. So what have changed? Oh, I don't think anything has changed. I think it's always been, you know, it's, it's a game of moving around pieces of paper. Okay, so the fact that there are 7 to 10% since 1871 in the U.S. stock market a year, that means that it's money moved around and not to real profits. Oh, I'm, I'm not saying that people can't make money in the stock market. I'm, okay. I 100% believe that people are making money. But on that 7 to 10%, you have to take... 2 to 3% inflation out. And for most people, take another 1% to 2% out minimum because they you know, have a, a portfolio manager. So now you've taken out 5 to 6%. Plus, if they're invested in a lot of mutuals, that could be another 0.1% to 1%. So it's like at the end of the day, that 7 to 10% could be 0 to 3% actual net gains in your pocket. So I'm totally against managers. So I, I all to DIY and saving those uh, little pieces of percentages because they're, as we both know, very significant. So that would save those percentages, of course. Yeah, and I think that's wise as well. But, you know, Buck Joffrey, who was on the show, has become a friend mm -hmm. of mine, and he really kind of influenced me. He's like, how many people do you know who aren't professional traders, like you know, that which immediately rules out Warren Buffett and Charlie Hone. How many people do you know who aren't professional traders or haven't created the stock themselves, like Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, who actually got rich through the stock market? And you're like, huh, I don't know of any. And it's like, how many people do you know who aren't professional real estate managers who've gotten very wealthy accidentally through real estate? And it's like, oh, yeah, no, I know a lot of people. You hear about, you know, almost everyone you know who bought a house in the 1970s, like, oh, yeah, we, you know, we became millionaires through our home accidentally, mm -hmm. not even trying to invest. And that really stuck with me, I guess. I think that people that are sometimes just don't talk about their stock investments and like how they became millionaires from that. That's more of a taboo than real estate. I got the feeling. I'm not sure. Maybe that's the reason for the question with Jeff Buckley. Eh, not Jeff Buckley. What was his name? Sorry. Buck Joffrey. You got it close. Yes. Yeah, I think that's probably true. And I think overall, it's you realize this. I don't know if you found this, but like you said, there is a lot of taboo around talking about money. And you realize this when you're in a, the very blessed position that I think you and I are in where you're looking for investments you know, you've had a couple of good years and you're starting to talk to people about investments and people are really uptight about it. And you also realize that you're not comfortable. Like, I'm not just going to 
put a post on Facebook saying, hey, I want to invest a bunch of money. You know, what do you guys recommend? So it's all these kinds of like backdoor conversations with other entrepreneurs or other people that you see that are doing well. And you kind of have to try and figure out like, is this person actually doing well? And I mm-hmm. only have found one or two people who are comfortable talking with me and saying, okay, well, I'm going to move this much into this portfolio. What do you think? And so I have a friend that I meet with here in Israel every week or every two weeks. And we talk about, okay, I'm hiring this firm to do this. And I'm thinking about this investment. And what do you think? And, and that's a real shame. It's a real, real shame because think about, you know, health is a much more kind of sensitive and private subject. And we all talk about it. It's like the first thing that comes up at lunch. Oh, how are you doing? Oh, well, you know, not too good. I went to the doctor and my cholesterol is elevated, but overall I'm doing pretty well, you know, and yet money, we can't talk about. It's just not comfortable. So I'm a little surprised that you're saying this. You probably heard of the fire movement. I haven't. Financial independence, retire early. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So these people are actually having these conversations all the time. And I'm in a bunch of those groups and people are comparing things and helping each other. And that's not a taboo at all. So maybe that's a start of a bigger movement. So people will be more comfortable of really speaking about their finances and, you know, making better for themselves. Right. Fire movement. I am definitely going to check that out. And we'll put a link to that in the podcast for folks. All right, at this point, I want to pause and take a moment to thank our sponsor, Four Sigmatic, who is making it easy for everyday people to unlock the incredible health benefits of mushrooms. I originally learned about Four Sigmatic when I met their founder at a conference in 2015, and I have been pretty much obsessed with their products ever since. Personally, I use their reishi mushroom tea most nights for an all-natural sleep aid. I carry their chaga immunity blend anytime I travel, and I've also pretty much switched out my usual coffee or yerba mate for their unbelievably awesome mushroom coffee, either in ground or in instant form. Now, what I love about the mushroom coffee is that it combines chaga for immune support with lion's mane for intense focus. And because of that, I actually find it to be more effective than most nootropics or stimulants, including Ritalin, despite having only 40 milligrams of caffeine. It's honestly insane. If you haven't tried out their products, I strongly, strongly recommend you do so. And to encourage you to give them a try, we've actually teamed up with Four Sigmatic to bring you an incredible 15% discount. To take advantage of that, just visit foursigmatic.com slash superhuman today. All right, back to the show. What are some other resources, Shlomo? And I also want to ask you for homework that we can give people. We love to assign homework. So what's a good first step that people can take? Is there some kind of exercise or, you know, thinking exercise, writing exercise, yeah. online, you know, thing that they should fill out? How can people get started to kind of change their mindsets and feel a little bit more comfortable around money? I mentioned briefly the roadmap that I spoke about. And one of the things is really know where you're at right now, that will ultimately start the process of being more confident. So I have a tool on my website that you can go and download, and that will help you calculate how much you're worth. It's super, super simple. Although it's a Google Sheet, which people are sometimes afraid of, it's super simple to calculate, and then you know how much you're worth. And from that, you start to you can start to build up your financial future and confidence. The URL for this is freefinancialself.com slash superhuman. Awesome. I appreciate that. And we will also link that up. If people are driving right now, we'll make sure to put that in the podcast episode. Don't download while you drive. Right. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Now, a little bit about location independence. Sure. Who's this for? Who's this not? I mean, people in the audience are thinking, wow, this is so cool. Shlomo's in Sri Lanka. And later on today, he's going to go trekking into the rainforest with his family. I want to do that. I mean, how can people assess whether or not this is right for them, whether or not this is something that they could actually do? So some people don't like traveling so much. Maybe they like, you know, going to the swimming pool and I, that's okay. But some people, you know, love that freedom that that creates. So this is why we are location independent. And I've seen people who actually either think it's too crazy or they just don't want to do that. And that's okay. 
but they're still interested in, you know, flexible vacations and have more time. So you don't have to go all the way to being location independent. You can just go and take longer vacations. Or for us, we're doing this is actually a workation. So we're blending our work with our vacation. It's we're here. We moved here for three months. So it really it depends what you want to have, but you don't have to go all the way. Very cool. And you said your wife is still working for a, a location independent Chinese company. Uh, not to that Chinese company, not anymore, but she's working for another fully remote company. The whole company is remote. So that really helped speed up things, of course. Very cool. Because I imagine for a lot of people, myself included, one of the challenges to being location independent is actually not them, but it's their spouse. So I'd love to hear any suggestions for finding <laughs> remote or location independent work for the people in our lives so that we can actually take advantage of the freedom we create for ourselves. You know, I got to tell you something. When my wife left that Chinese company, which we, she started working for them non-remotely in Beijing. And then when we left to Israel, she still worked for them for one year. After she finished working with them and she started looking for another job, that was uh, when our girl was born, we wanted to have a location independent job for her. That was a must. Okay. And it didn't work with companies in Israel. But with companies outside of Israel, you got many of those. So you can just, I mean, we asked around, she asked her uh, previous managers and eventually she got through that job. But there are a lot of opportunities to get remote jobs. And yeah, some countries are not as good as that as others. I mean, there are a lot in the US, China is not good at that. And Israel is not good at that still. I mean, when we spoke with Israeli companies, they said, yeah, you can work one day from home and like, right. mm, no, that's not what we're aiming for. You're missing the point here. Yeah. So that was a condition. Okay. We're looking for a remote job working remotely. Even if it's something really good, we still prefer to downsize the salary and live a better lifestyle, which is 10 times more. Totally. Ah, oh, man, I, I'm going to sit you down with my wife. <laughs> We'll just have a powwow next time you're in Israel. We'll do dinner because I totally agree. And I put out a YouTube video recently. I actually don't know if it has come out recently because I don't know when this podcast comes out, but um, that freedom is the new currency. Like freedom is worth more than money because most people, myself included, according to my coach, want money just to have freedom. So how ridiculous is it to try and make as much money as you can and then realize because you're spending so much time making money, you have zero you don't freedom. Have freedom. Exactly. Yeah. Skip the step, go straight to the freedom. Problem solved, you know? <laughs> like Yeah, you can just build back from the freedom and then figure out the rest of the things. Right. Any resources that were particularly helpful for you and your wife finding remote jobs, websites, networks, Facebook groups? Oh, that would be a nomad list is a good resource. Mm -hmm. There are really so many. I mean, just a Google search will bring you so many options out there. It's not hard to find. I admit that if you're doing tech work, like coding, that will be easier. Mm -hmm. But you can also find in marketing and other things. I think that the hardest that we found to get are product managers. Mm -hmm. She's a support manager. So you have support jobs remote. So that's possible. Yeah, it does seem tricky. And especially if you're in law or medicine, it's harder. Although I have a friend who's a uh, tele doctor. I don't know if that's the right term, but basically okay. he serves clients on Skype and it's an amazing living for him. I actually bumped into somebody doing coaching, you know, exercises, but that would be online. So he follow what you do and mentor you and track your progress, but everything's online. Yeah. So I guess everything can be tell us something to some extent. To some extent, I agree. Yeah. No, so maybe you won't have your three months vacation, but maybe you have your one month vacation because it would work this way. So things can work. You can flexibilize your life if that's a word. Yeah, totally. And, you know, I encourage people to read not just Remote by David Heinemeyer Hansen and Jason Fried, the former of which is a past guest on the show, but there are a lot of books about this change. And people will realize, and companies are realizing, that remote workers are just more effective. You're happier when you see your kid every day. You're happier when you don't have to commute. You're happier when you don't work in a cubicle. And people thought for many, many years it was the other way around, that people slack off at home, but it's not the case. And you know, if you are the kind of person where you're like, look, I could never be productive at home, 
I recommend that people get the Amex Platinum card, which gets you one year free membership to any WeWork. You, you know, you can drop into any WeWork you want oh, wow. and you get access to all the lounges. I make no money off referring people, but we might put a link that I might get some points. But you get access to all the airport lounges. So you can work from airport lounges. You can go to you can any live WeWork. Airport. <laughs> yeah, you could go to any WeWork anywhere in the world and, you know, drop in. And I'm pretty sure that there's a WeWork in most major cities that you would want to travel to. So it's really amazing. Yeah, and there's no lack of working space some other places. There are really tons of those. God, yes. In Chiang Mai, there's one that's free. <laughs> I mean, Yes, we've been to that. I have a post on this. I've actually done it yeah, we there for two months. Yeah, that was amazing. It's a really good one. Really cool. Yeah, I have a, a team member who's been working there for the last two months and uh, is now moving on to Bali. Tough life. Tough life. <laughs> Tough life. Tough <laughs> life. Freedom first. Now, I want to ask some rapid fire questions here, Slow, because anytime I get someone on the show who thinks as much about living a, a deliberate life as I do, it would be a shame not to ask. So are there any skills, habits, or routines that you feel make you perform at a higher level? That's a very good question. So I just started doing my morning routine, but I really just just started. I'm unfortunately the kind of person who starts and then stops, like I assume many others. Mm. But this time, because we are on our vacation, I decided that this is really important for me and I want to start. So I'm starting small with water in the morning, then a little bit of exercises. Only then I started starting work. So that's working for me so far. And let's hope I'm keeping up with this. Very cool. What are some products or services that you simply couldn't live without? I've been wanting to ask you this question ever since I found out that you're location independent. <laughs> <laughs> I have two. One is a rather disappointing magic Google Sheet. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. I can't live without that because everything is on Excel sheets and all the work that I do. So everything is on that. Something that I found very helpful for me is something that called weekplan.net. It follows the book for uh, the seven habits of really effective people. And that one really helps you to put your tasks into roles in your life and then make sure you're giving a priority to each one of those. And it's also, you can put things for important and urgent. So you can file all that. And that's really working for me very well. Weekplan.net. Weekplan.net. Awesome. We will put that in the show notes. I was expecting more... Uh, Location independent, you know, I have this little what? special charger that I can't live without because it charges oh, all my oh, devices oh. at once. But no. no, it's all very simple. Simple is good. I want to recommend a, a book to people, though. Yeah, please. I was going to ask the next question was, what are a few books that have changed your oh, life? Oh, sorry. <laughs> By all means, take the reins. So I actually read it just recently, but this is kind of the Bible for the fire movement. And this is called Your Money or Your Life by Vicky uh, Robin, Vicky Robin. And this really gets you to really understand in your finances, defining when it's enough. When you, you're at the point like you don't need any more or any less. You're at the point of enough. And this is when you're content and confidence. So that's really, really helpful for people. And the other book, just because now we're in Sri Lanka, and that's been an amazing book, it's called Sri Lanka, The New Country. And I've learned a lot about 30 year of civil war here, but it's absolutely amazing book. I have it in my Google Reads, in my Goodreads profile. I know you have one. I actually yeah. follow you, Jonathan. Oh, that's so awesome. So you can check those there, but these are definitely two books I recommend. Awesome. And I also want to ask this fire movement, where do people learn more about that? How do they get involved? So I think that the most common, the largest community is called Choose Fi on Facebook. And there are other resources like to just train you for Fi. So there are a lot of things out there. The interesting thing, I can't say the interesting thing, that actually it's a bit of a problem because a lot of the fire movement are in the US and they're US based. So a lot of the things that they talk about are actually just relevant for the US, mm -hmm. while the rest of the world, it's uh, more problematic. So I'm part of a Europe Fi group, which is really cool. So you got the firehub. I think it's EU or .com. I'll check afterwards. I'll send you the link. And there's also a podcast called uh, Fire Europe Podcast, Financial Independence Europe Podcast. So you really need to 
see where you're at the world most of the time and what's your nationality. And according to that, choose your group. That would be the most helpful. Awesome. And I know Dimitris will put all of those links in the blog post for this episode. I guess last couple questions here, Shlomo, I would have to ask this question because we've been talking about money. What's the best $100 you've ever spent or 350 shekels you've ever spent? 350 shekels. I'd say not spending them. <laughs> That's a really good answer. <laughs> Saving it. Compound interest. Compound, compound. I mean, I speak with people about, you know, the cost of a cup of coffee. Okay. It's not just that 10, 15 shekels or whatever, $5. It's $5 over 30 years at 7 to 10% interest. So that's a lot of money. Well, yeah, but I also, I have to admit, like I side with, um, and I don't agree with Hermit Sethi on a lot of things, but on this, I agree that like the mindset of miserliness, like I've seen this play out, I won't say with who, but people close to me. And I think the mindset of like, oh, I just need to save that extra three to $5 a month. I think that that creates a scarcity mindset. Whereas I'm much more like the, I just need to earn this much and then I don't need to think about that cup of coffee. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I totally get and to do that if that's what makes you happy. It's just that knowing the ramifications of this. If that goes in, in your plan and you really want it, that's fine. Okay, just choose this and not just do it just because everybody else do it. That's all I'm saying. Awesome. All right, last few questions here. I know we're coming up on time. Complete this sentence for me. Most people would be much better off if they just... Start looking at their finances now. That's really important as early as possible. I choose that. That's awesome. Shlomo, second to last question here. Where can people learn more and get in touch with you? I know we gave them a form to fill out, but if people want to reach out to you directly, how do they do that? So they can do that on my website, freefinancialself.com. I'm also on Instagram, also at freefinancialself, Twitter, freefinancialsf. Facebook is my name. LinkedIn is my name. Yeah, and the download one is uh, freefinancialself.com slash superhuman. I think I gave it all. Awesome. I just uh, downloaded the gift myself, so I appreciate that. Cool. And the last, last question is, if people remember one message from this episode and take it with them for the rest of their lives, what would you hope for that message to be? I really think that doing things today before it's too late. I really, really believe in that. And I'm talking about freedom and I'm talking about finances and I'm talking about aligning those together, really understanding where you're at and where you're going. Shlomo, I want to thank you so much for your time. Uh, you know, taking it's been time awesome. away from your beautiful Sri Lanka, you know, workcation to chat with me. And uh, I really enjoyed it. Awesome. Well, it's great being here. Thank you very much. All right, my friend. Take care. Cheers. All right, super friends, that is all we have for you today, but I hope you guys really enjoyed the show and I hope you learned a ton of actionable information, tips, advice that will help you go out there and overcome the impossible. If you've enjoyed the show, please take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher or drop us a quick little note on the Twitter machine, at Go Superhuman. Also, if you have any ideas for anyone out there who you would love to see on the show, we always love to hear your recommendations. You can submit on our website or you can just drop us an email and let us know. That's all for today, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for tuning in to the Becoming Superhuman podcast. For more great skills and strategies or for links to any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit www.becomingasuperhuman.com slash podcast. We'll see you next time.